thank you so much uh, for joining today's UCLA Anderson EMBA Experience event, Leaders in Technology event. Uh, this event, uh, hopefully many of you have been getting our emails about our eight part series. This is actually our second to last, where we introduce you to the diversity of thought that UCLA Anderson could can provide to you as a student. Each of these events has had a different theme or industry featured. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to really understand, you know, what kind of academic centers we have and resources we have that align with different themes or industries that you may be interested, maybe you're currently working in or interested in transitioning into. I'm really excited that today's event is really highlighting our, our strengths in teaching technology management. Um, this includes our Easton Center for Technology. And then we're gonna follow it with a great panelist that we've got, panel that we've got together, current students, some alumni who work in technology and can share the value they got from the program as well. So the eight part series um, we're gonna put in the chat, you know, please feel free. Some of those uh, have already been recorded and posted. So feel free to check those out. Um, and this event, I just a couple housekeeping things. This event is being recorded and will be put on YouTube afterwards as well for, for on-demand viewing. We will have a Q&A break at the very end. Feel free, you can add questions throughout um, and we'll definitely get to those in the chat or at the end. Um, and then this event is not really a Q&A about general admissions, but we have lots of events that are open and, and talk more about our admissions process. So we hope you can join those. I'd love to now turn it over to our, our keynote speaker and introduce uh, two of our members from the Easton Center uh, of uh, Technology Management. Introduce Terry Kramer we have here, Professor Terry Kramer. Gosh, he's one of the crown jewels, I think, of the UCLA Anderson program. He uh, He's not only the faculty director for the Anderson uh, Technology Management Center, he's also a professor. He knows EMBA's very, very well. He's taught in the EMBA program. He's advised consulting teams, uh, and he's even brought them abroad. So, so happy he can join us today. And Darina, so glad she can be here as well. She's from uh, the program manager, holds all the pieces together of all the things that Terry's going to talk about today uh, and she'll be here for the Q&A. So now I'd like to pass it over to Terry to tell you a little bit about what's going on in technology now. He has a real, he has a real uh, a point on that and then also all the great things the Easton Center can offer you. So take it away, Terry. Excellent. <clears throat> hey, Shannon, a big thank you. Thank you and welcome to all of you here. I'm going to share my screen here to go through a few uh, slides. So hopefully you can uh, see it okay uh, here. And let me just start out about why to me technology is so important for all leaders, everyone that goes to business school, etc. Is that, you know, we're living in a world where technology matters more and more and not just for technology companies like Google and Amazon, et cetera, but in almost every industry, there are opportunities and challenges related to technology in new product creation, in competitive challenges to position of companies, in terms of uh, public policy issues, et cetera. And so I think, you know, understanding technology and ensuring the curriculum is focused there and engaging is one of the key reasons to come to Anderson and to get an MBA because again of the, uh, the impact that it has. Now, what I plan to do, and it'll be fairly rapid fire, but you get a taste of it, is I'd like to talk about a few of the trends in technology and what the implications are from a leadership standpoint. Because I believe at the end of the day, the reason you go to a business school and a great one like Anderson is to really develop as a leader, to think about where's innovation gonna happen, to think about opportunities and challenges, to resource an organization, to work with public stakeholders, all of that is leadership. And I think it's always important to say, what are the leadership implications. I'll talk about then the Easton Center and what we do, and then how you can engage uh, with the, uh, the Easton Center. So I always start out all of my classes and events with a reminder about where we are in terms of technology as a society, because it gives you a sense of where we've come from and where we're going. And just to start out, if we go back to the 80s, the 80s was the era of the PC. 
And I remember when I went to business school, we had an IBM PC portable. It was about 50 pounds, but it was the early, early PCs, unconnected, but it did allow early uh, levels of automation. And then if you fast forward to the mid nineties, we had the era of the internet that all these PCs now could be connected so that people could communicate with one another, buy goods and services, shop, et cetera, et cetera. Then if you fast forward to 2007, to be specific, you had the iPhone revolution, the smartphone revolution. So the whole idea began saying, listen, anything that I can do on the internet at home or in my office, I should be able to do on the go. And that created another wave of technology-based innovation. The latest area where we're at today is we are in the era of data and artificial intelligence. That all of these interactions on the internet and location information on our smartphones and social networks we participate with on an opt-in basis are collecting lots of data that is allowing new product creation to occur, new insights to occur, and actually in many areas, fundamental transformational services in areas like healthcare and in education. Now, where are some of the foundational technologies that have allowed this product service innovation to happen? Number one, high-speed networks. More and more, and we see it here in the US, that fifth generation networks, 5G networks, these are networks that get a gigabit a second or faster. So these are faster than most of our home networks uh, or office networks, these are being deployed very, very rapidly. Here in the US, about 50% of the population is covered with fifth generation network capability. If you go to markets like China, it's even more. In many cases, China is eclipsing the US 10 to 15 to one in terms of number of sites uh, deployed. The second big trend is connected devices. And this is the idea without sounding too creepy here that at some point in the future, everything will be connected. Our bodies will be connected with wearable devices, our cars and all sorts of vehicles will be connected, buildings will be connected, our appliances at our home will be connected. And all of that will allow data capture that creates in and of itself new products and services. And we'll talk about what those are, but the idea of taking a physical piece of hardware and connecting it to the internet is where a lot of new capabilities is coming from. Cloud computing. So many of you have probably heard of companies like AWS or Azure. These are companies that have allowed all sorts of other companies to store and effectively access data and be able to use that information wherever they go. And again, you'll find more and more in technology that you need an ecosystem to create great outcomes. You need infrastructure, you need devices, you need content, et cetera. Final enabling technology is the ability to deal with all this data. And we've all heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning, the ability to make sense of data and making sense of data isn't just looking at what's happened in the past, but it's being able to predict in the future what is happening. So it's the ability with certain types of data in healthcare, whether that be our current vital signs, whether that be clinical research, to be able to say somebody's more likely or not to have incidents of cancer, of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. Same thing in autonomous vehicles, the ability to predict so that a, a vehicle can understand if somebody's crossing the street at five miles an hour and the car's going at 30 miles an hour, do you need to take an evasive action or not? But a lot of this use of data is predicting future activities. On the most basic level, recommendation engines, what we would have with Amazon or Netflix, where it has a sense of what we've already bought and suggesting what we might want in the future. That would all be an example of that. Now, what are some of these kind of cool products and services that are being created? Autonomous vehicles. And I always share with my students, the area that I'm most excited about is autonomous vehicles and ride sharing coming together. With autonomous vehicles and ride sharing, we have a more affordable, safe ride sharing service. There's an argument that 
80, 90% of the people today that buy and use a car will not need to. The average car is only used about 5% of the time. The average car somebody spends about $750 a month to pay for, to maintain, to insure, et cetera. Again, for 4% of the time that's being used. Those cars in the US generate about 37,000 deaths of human related accidents. If you could put all that together in an autonomous vehicle with ride sharing, you have an environment where transportation has changed fundamentally. Virtual assistants. So think of a Siri or uh, on your smartphone or think of Alexa on steroids. With proper data and contextualization of who you are, where you are, what you like to buy, et cetera, the ability to create a customer service representative, a sales representative on a virtual basis. This could, again, potentially create better accuracy, better information, lower costs. This, by the way, also creates a lot of implications about the future of work. What happens to people that today are truck drivers for autonomous vehicles or customer service representatives when virtual assistants come in, who handles the negative externalities, the job training, et cetera. And if you're starting to feel like I'm bringing up super exciting transformational stuff and super scary things, then I've achieved my purpose. That is exactly why learning these areas matters so much. These are fundamental leadership issues. How do you navigate in these? How do you create the right opportunity without the negatives? Voice-based internet. This is the idea of Alexa with Amazon. Also, if you go to markets like India, more and more access to the internet is being done on a voice and video basis, not texting and typing, but voice and video. Completely changes the model of internet access and who can win in that environment. Diagnostic tools. If you had the ability with an opt-in basis to in essence have a Google search engine for healthcare, this is what Google Health is working on. This is what Amazon is working on. This is what IBM has been working on to be able to ingest all of the clinical trials, all of the research, all of the information of where you are today with your own health and to improve diagnostic accuracy that would improve healthcare outcomes. That is the frontier in technology. Now, there's a lot of things that have to happen to make sure that occurs. There needs to be access to data. You need to have the ability to understand that data. You need devices that capture data. But that is where a lot of future innovation can potentially happen. Quint plays and streaming. I'll give you two examples. This is the idea of four or five services coming together to be offered to end users. If you look at AT&T here in the US, they now with their acquisition of Time Warner are able to offer you home landline service, internet, high-speed internet service. They're able to offer you pay TV service through direct TV. They're able to offer you mobility service, cellular service through AT&T mobility, and now content through uh, all the things that HBO is doing and CNN is doing, et cetera. That is an example of companies that are trying to converge and bring services together. If you think that's a lot, go to India and look at Reliance Geo. They are offering services that look very similar to Zoom video conferencing. They're offering e-commerce related services. They're offering content, another form of a quint play that is attracting new, uh, new users. Final item is, while we all use the internet, there's still about 3 billion people in the world that don't have access to the internet. They may have a basic smart, uh, basic phone for uh, you know, talking and texting, but they don't have internet access. There's a variety of new satellite-based players and terrestrial players that are trying to provide access to the internet for people that have never had it uh, before. So if all of that isn't exciting enough, um, let's layer on current events and current events change the course of the future. So COVID-19 at a fundamental level is changing the pace of adoption of many technology-based products. 
When we think about today, where are we doing things? Where are we working? Where are we shopping? Where are we being entertained? It's now more and more that place has changed to home. And in many cases, there's been a step up in adoption of new technologies, telehealth, e-commerce, video conferencing. And while we all as human beings like to think things will revert back to the original state whenever we deal with COVID successfully, my own belief is we will never be fully back to that environment because people have tasted the benefits of e-commerce, of video conferencing, of streaming services, et cetera. And my guess is there'll be some sort of hybrid mode that we'll end up in between. And again, as an MBA to think about, do you have a mental map that will allow you to determine what that future state looks like? What is the impact on your organization? How do you think about innovation differently? All of that matters a huge amount. Second thing is on racial injustices. There's more and more today concerns about the credibility of our institutions, whether that be government, whether that be businesses, whether that be uh, uh, individuals and communities, but there's concern about our institutions, the ability to manage effectively and serve all stakeholders, not just shareholders, not just customers, but thinking about employees and thinking about communities matters. And technology, you know, notwithstanding a lot of ills it's created in certain areas, has also created some real gain. I just hosted an event with Juan Enriquez yesterday, who's a famous kind of author and, and investor, um, who's written a book on technology and ethics. And one of the points he made is if you look at the George Floyd incident that occurred, if we didn't have smartphones, you would not have had the rapid awareness of a, a massive racial injustice occurring. So again, the use of technology can be good and bad and your ability to navigate that as a leader matters a, a huge amount. So why does all this matter? And this is a little bit of a pitch for why people need to get an MBA. I, you know, I, I worry sometimes I see people trying to get cute, talking themselves out of getting an MBA. And I tell my students, I've got several of my former students here, um, you're solving for long-term value creation. You're solving for your career trajectory. You're solving for the ability to get into the, the most difficult leadership roles or entrepreneurial roles and be able to be effective in that role. You're not solving for tomorrow. You're solving for five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So what are all the implications of these technologies on leadership? And these are a lot of the things that we try and cover in my classes, in our conferences and other courses at Anderson is thinking about where's there gonna be value creation and value destruction and how do you manage all of that in a technology dra uh, driven world? How do you think about business models? How companies make money is changing. More and more we have advertising based business models, we have outcome based business models, et cetera. We have more and more cases of interdisciplinary innovation. One of the things we've got going right now at Anderson is we have a Centers at Anderson initiative, which is focused on working across all of the schools at UCLA. And one of the, the, the great blessings we have at UCLA is we have a great medical school, we have a great engineering school, we have a great you know, uh, public policy school, et cetera. And working across those to think about where innovation is gonna happen is one of the key requirements. Changing competitive position, we've talked about, and then this broader role of technology and society is where and how are you gonna to have to deal with our tech lash issues, data privacy issues, future of work issues, um, et cetera. All of this gets us to the Easton Center. And what is the focus of the Easton Center? leadership preparedness in a tech-driven world. So it used to be our focus was preparing our students to go work at the great tech companies. And many of them do, and I feel great when I hear all that news. But candidly, the, the line is blurring on what is a tech company. Every single company today, agricultural companies, uh, uh, financial service companies, retailers, et cetera, are all becoming tech companies and how you are prepared in that environment matters a lot. Now, what does the Easton Center do? 
curriculum. We have a variety of courses in a variety of areas of technology, technology management, which I teach. There's a healthcare tech class, a FinTech class. We have a media tech class. In the last couple of years, we've added courses in artificial intelligence, product management. We do a global immersion in China that I lead that's all about technology in China. And we try and focus on the horizontal, which is not just what is the bright, shiny object, the cool technology product, but what are those implications for leadership? How do you think about spotting those opportunities? How do you think about your competitive position? We have an Easton certificate that Darina is an expert in, can tell you a lot more. But if you take a certain number of our courses and uh, help out in some of the critical events that we have, you can get an Easton certificate, which is a special designation that says you've got special depth of knowledge in technology related issues. We have a bunch of conferences and workshops, and I've got some of them I'm going to share in just uh, a second here. But on the specialization requirement, we've listed them here in detail. Um, the requirement is to take our tech management class plus 12 units of electives, plus attend several of our workshops, events, and a development activity. And that basically gets you the Easton certificate. And again, more depth in technology related issues. What are the other initiatives that we've got? We have an innovation challenge, which is focused on working across campus to identify a promising area of innovation. This year, focus on healthcare and sustainability. And there's basically, these are startup venture ideas where there's prize money and most importantly, learnings about what does it take to innovate effectively. We have a LinkedIn uh, a private user group called Tech Talk at Anderson. We can share news about what's going on and what's relevant. We have a group of Easton fellows. We have a mentoring program. And then we have a whole bunch of events. And by the way, and Darina can share more, but you are welcome to join any of these events. And it may give you a good taste of what goes on at the school and the issues we cover. Our Innovate Conference, which is one of our two big conferences a year, will be on Thursday night and Friday next week. Um, one of our keynote speakers is Nan Bowden. She's the head, the COO of the Everyday Robot Project that's uh, formerly part of Google X. So these are these kind of breakthrough moonshot type projects. And she'll talk about um, robotics and where that is going. Uh, Maggie Wilderotter, former CEO of Frontier Communications, she's been on 35 different boards, um, public boards, so a huge number. She sits on the board of HP Enterprises, Lyft, Costco. She's the board chair at DocuSign. I'm going to be interviewing her. Neri Singh is the former head of Accenture's Digital Transformation uh, Business Unit. I'm going to be interviewing him. Mike Stern, for those of you that think agriculture and farming doesn't have tech in it, you will find out from Mike, they are all about it. He's the head of Bayer's digital farming uh, group, and it's all about data and a company that they bought that was a Google spin out. So what are the opportunities to engage uh, here? Attend our events. Um, obviously take courses. And if you want to sit in on one of my classes, you're absolutely welcome. Just send me an email on that. Get an Easton certificate, be part of Tech Talk at Anderson, um, participate in innovation challenges. There's a variety of things. And again, just a reminder, leadership preparedness in a tech-driven world. That's what we're trying to achieve. And again, I hope you'll find that from the students that are going to be on the panel here about their own leadership uh, journey. Shannon, I promised I would not run late, so I will let you know it's almost 12.55. If we want to yeah. take a question or just move on, you let us know. You know what, Professor Kramer, thank you so much for your time. I mean, I know I'm energized. I'm getting like side messages from, from attendees right now that they can't wait to take your classes. So I know that was rapid fire, but I promise you, if you attend Anderson, Terry is so accessible and he is available to students. So you will get a lot of time with him. I just wanted to give you a little tease and taste today. 
Excellent. Thanks Excellent. so much, Professor Kramer. Good luck. Let me know anything I can do for you guys. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. So now, thank you to, to all the attendees. We're going to move now into our panelists. Um, I think it's you know it's one thing to hear from a professor, but I, I know many of you are thinking, and and I know Terry talked about the value, but many of you may be thinking, you know. An MBA is a big commitment. Is now the right time? Well, let's hear from you know our panelists to really get the uh, experience of what the value they got. I'm so excited they could be joining us today. You can see a little bit of information about them all right here, and we'll get to know them over the next you know 30 minutes. So um, I'm going to go ahead and have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Please feel free, I will leave time at the end for Q&A, but feel free to start adding some of your questions if you want into the chat, or I'll let you ask them live. Um, I do wanna ask one in a true EMBA fashion, um, Brian, who's our current student, uh, I, are you gonna have a few minutes to chat before we, uh, yes. before you have to run to a meeting? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So I want to actually, we'll, we'll get to the alumni in a sec, but Brian is a current student. Um, I want to ask him if he can just share a little bit about his background, why he chose to get an MBA and, and add Anderson. And then he actually recently participated, participated in the Innovate Challenge that uh, Professor Kramer spoke about. So I wanted him to share a little bit about that. So if you could kick off and then we'll get to the alumni. Sure. Uh, so my name is Brian. Uh I already had a tech background when I uh, decided to join uh, UCLA and my genesis at that time was really, you know, how do I broaden my skills? Uh, you know, how do I really get broad because you can be very deep, but you know, how do you get the breadth? And I had just taken a move with my company to the East Coast, Florida, where I'm currently located. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was finding ways of getting back, right? So uh, I have uh, you know, over 15 years of experience in technology, worked for a, a biotech company, Amgen, which is in uh, the Southern California area. And it was more about, you know, how could I challenge myself? Uh, the experience is obviously great, right? And it, it's helped bro broaden my aperture. And, you know, when Kramer says technology, you know, sometimes you can be misled as just knowing the trends. It's also sometimes about how to apply it. And a lot of times you could be really well versed at the technology, but if you don't know how to apply it in a business scale, it doesn't matter, right? So that's kind of uh, what's really been helpful. Uh, the NOA challenge, uh, which happened, uh, I would say, I think almost a year, you know, it was late, uh, sometime last year, uh, had taken part in that. And that's where we met uh, some of our uh, counterparts. Essentially think of it as an avenue where we could meet people across schools. So we bumped into this, uh, you know, engineering uh, student who was doing his PhD research. It was an idea in academia and was about how can we detect cancer early through a blood test. Uh, that idea went through the Innovate Challenge. And, uh, you know, a few months later, we actually took it to our coursework and now it's incorporated, right? So, uh, you know, it's a healthcare medtech type startup, but it wouldn't have been possible without this avenue. And I think that's the key. Uh, a lot of times it'll end up being how you maximize your value and how you try to uh, make the best of your experience, right? It won't come in a platter and you've got to look at opportunities that are there during experience, uh, reach out. And there are avenues like these competitions and conferences where you can actually get to meet other people, even if they're not business school students. And I think that's the beauty of being in a multidisciplinary uh, university. So I'll leave it at that, Shannon. Thanks so much, Brian, for, for sharing that experience. And hopefully we'll get you, get you back after your meeting here in a few minutes. But now I'm gonna move on to our alumni, um, Kais, Farzana, and Avisak. And I'm gonna ask if each of you can just go one by one and just start off by introducing your background as well, why you um, decided to get an MBA and why you picked Anderson. So Kais, why don't we go to you next and I'll go down the line. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Shannon. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here with you guys today. My name is Kais, and I am part of the MBA class of uh, class of 2019. Um, my background, you know, I'm a veteran. Uh, I served in the United States Marine Corps, and I was a small business owner. I am still a small business owner. Um, I decided to get an MBA when I realized that. Uh, the company was prepared to start scaling. And as I started to learn more and more about how to scale my organization, I realized uh, there was a lot to, you know, to still learn. So while we're, you know, 
running the company and things are going well, you start to kind of wonder, what do you, you know, where can I improve and what can I do better? Um, so joined the AMBA program. Uh, I was part of the monthly program, made some amazing friends, uh, lifelong friends. I learned a ton and uh, we've grown the business uh, exponentially and started a new venture as well uh, with several other students. And it's been an amazing, amazing ride so far. And I'm looking forward to discussing it further with you guys. Thanks, Kais. Go to Farzana next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this. And um, just to share my story and journey, um, I did come from a tech background as well. I had a computer science degree, and then I um, got the Eastern certificate. I'm very happy about that. Um, I decided to go back to school um, because I wanted to shift from fintech back into healthcare. I'd spent about 10 years in healthcare shifted over to fintech and wanted to work my way back. And I thought the MBA would give me a good boost and transition. And I was able to do that. So success story there. Um, I, while I was at Anderson, um, one of the cool things I took advantage of is the interdisciplinary um, opportunities at Anderson. So I did take some electives at the School of Public Health. And I think that was very helpful for me. Um, and now I'm working at a healthcare startup company. We have a conversational AI helping people um, coach them to better health, inform them, instruct them. And we use uh, our AI engine to kind of understand people where their mind is, what kind of language is most effective. And it's been very rewarding. So I thank Anderson for the opportunity to make this move. Thanks. Thank you so much for that introduction. Abhishek, if you could bring us home with the introductions. Sure, thank you, Sharon, again uh, for, for inviting me. Um, I'm Abhishek, I am a uh, pass out from 2018 batch. Um, I am a technology leader, I see myself as a translator. Um, I oversee um, the theatrical business uh, application portfolio at Sony Pictures Entertainment. Um, my journey is a little funny. Um, it started uh, as teaching at my undergrad school back in India in Bitspilani. I used to teach technology courses there for a couple of years and then I moved my way through a consulting firm in Bangalore to do some IT consulting and then landed up in Sony um, and I've been here for last 13, 14 years and uh, gone through many different phases of ups and downs of the company and learned a lot from the process. Um, I think the reason I chose uh, Anderson was threefold. Uh, the first thing is my passion for learning always. Um, and I wanted to go to a school that's, uh, that's here in local and, and relevant in terms of where I'm located. Um, the second thing obviously was uh, the pillars of how you learn things, how you apply in your day-to-day um, your, your, uh, -day work. The pillars are knowing the new concept and having some kind of a collective learning by attending it with bright individuals who are from diverse background. I think that was one of the key motivation for me to join this team. And my team had uh, people from the military, people uh, from doctor profession, you know, finance people, and you, you learned so much about the stuff. And as Professor Kramer was talking about, I think learning about the technology is one thing, but understanding the different perspectives and how to apply it, as Brian mentioned, is absolutely critical. And I think Anderson is a fantastic place for that because you have so many different certificates, different programs to explore as Farzana also mentioned. Um, and I'm also an Eastern certificate uh, holder um, and, uh, and never look back from there. And now I also advise on a couple of uh, retail startups. So it's gone to a diff different level um, in addition to my current role and I'm, I'm super happy with where I am. Thank you so much, Abhishek. I appreciate that. So I want to go back, you know, back to Kais and talk about uh, Kais was, you know, you came in as, as you said, a small business owner. You had a couple businesses, I feel, that you were actually trying to scale. If you can really get into kind of some more of the details about how the Anderson curriculum and the network really uh, helped you start to scale your businesses. Yeah, absolutely, Shannon. And, you know, as a small business owner, you're always trying to find, um, you know, the, the niche that you're going to kind of grow, grow within. So my business, you know, we're, we're manufacturing and we're providing electronic security and mass notification systems. We, we consider life safety products. Um, and just before entering into uh, Anderson, um, I was, you know, beginning to put together a team for providing, you know, GPS tracking watches for children. So 
I made that my goal at Anderson to um, expand my network, of course, which is one of the, the biggest takeaways from an EMBA program, from any MBA program, uh, but also to bring this product to market. Um, and being a part of the monthly program, um, it, it really helped me, you know, this is something that's really unique about Anderson, right? You have the monthly and the biweekly programs kind of running simultaneously. And really it, it's, it's, a, it's a benefit that I didn't really quite understand when I first joined the program, because you end up with essentially two cohorts worth of networking. Um, and, and as you guys know, the networking opportunities coming out of a program like this is, uh, you, you can't really put a value on it. It's, it's, it's enormous. Uh, and so my program for our business creation option to pursue the GPS tracking watch for children uh, made up of both biweekly and monthly students. So it, it's really something that I encourage all of you to try to take advantage of, right? Depending on whichever uh, cohort you decide to take is to really kind of reach out and, and expand that network as much as possible. Um, so None of, you know, nobody here will be surprised by the fact that listening to uh, Professor Kramer, there are tons of other professors, amazing professors, you're gonna gain a lot of knowledge. Um, and especially with, a, with something like what happened with COVID, you know, the GPS watch business, which has uh, launched, we have our full team from the EMBA program. Uh, we're fully a market, we're VC backed. Um, and the COVID situation kind of really uh, twisted things up for us, but, the plans and the um, the skills and the knowledge that we learned during the AMPA program really helped us take the situation in hand and adjust. So I was talking with Shannon earlier. Uh, you know, we have we had two avenues to go to directly to consumers with our with our product, and then kind of a phase two approach where we do business to business. And the COVID situation decided to. Uh, essentially encouraged us to switch the bottle around a little bit and go to business to business model first. Um, and so it's those types of skills that uh, the EMBA program, I think, um, uh, played a huge part in, in the success that we've had so far. So I guess, you know, long story short, we can say that a lot of these things are coincidental, right? The exponential growth of my current business, um, the successful launch of a startup that you know stemmed out of the EMPA program uh, could have all potentially happened without the EMPA program, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and give uh, Shannon and the EMPA program a little bit of the credit for the success that, that, that I've been uh, able to enjoy over the last couple of years. So um, yeah, Thanks. I mean, and that was a lot to take in, but. <laughs> okay, thanks so much for, for breaking that all down. I think that's really helpful for a lot of people here. I mean, if you come from this tech background, you've got a lot of great ideas. And so I think really cool to hear from you. And I know you'd be open to sharing more, um, you know, if anyone wanted to reach out and, and get more details on that. So kind of switching, um, Farzana and Abhishek, you know, both of you have like two and a half years out of the program now. And I know you've both made career moves and and I'm, I'm really interested, Farzana, if you could, kick us off with just talking about when you really reflect, you know, again, having some distance from it, like what were those like key learning outcomes or the, the key abilities that you learned from the MBA that have helped you really progress down this uh, kind of outcome, career outcome that they've, you've reached and this goal that you've reached uh, since leaving the program? I think two broadly, and I can dive in a little bit deeper. One is um, communication skills, learning what to say to be heard to help uh, my career grow and or just make moves within an organization. When I have an idea, I know how to sell it and talk about it and, and how to market it within and without. Um, so that's definitely from the EMBA program. That was not from my undergraduate degree at all. Um, and then Secondly, analysis. Like I do have a computer science degree, but the but the business analysis was lacking. So again, when I'm trying to be influential, when I'm trying to sell an idea, um, I know how to back it up based on what I've learned through like accounting, finance, and, and all of Terry's classes. I was a big fan. I spent like four quarters with him. So, um, <laughs> and it's it's pretty remarkable after four quarters with Terry Kramer that I've learned how to um, and he was a big uh, 
proponent of the idea that leaders need to not solve business problems for today. They need to be visionaries that can see what's going to happen, understand trends, and take their organization toward the direction of the future. And he's um, really ingrained those ideas and concepts. And um, I'm able to kind of parrot his ideas, his thoughts, and, and it's been very effective with um, my career growth and the broad um, scope I've been able to uh, like contribute and, and add value to the two organizations that I worked at after I left. And so I was a, like a, a product manager at um, a FinTech company. Um, and then I moved into my current role. I had one stop along the way. And then now this is like the healthcare company that I envisioned it's aligned with my values, helping underserved populations. We predominantly support Medicare and Medicaid um, uh, members. And I'm calling the members, patients, the, the, the uh, end user of the product to help educate themselves and um, what we call like um, healthcare self-efficacy. So for people who um, didn't have access in a very low touch, low cost way to learn and better take care of themselves, coming from a tech background, but really having the kind of impact I wanted to have in, in the world. So that's, and to sell the story and to sell the movement is really the, the two main skills I've gotten from Anderson. So the communication the analysis and being able to pitch an idea and get everyone on board. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, I know Terry is, is he really is a visionary. And one thing that I, I like you kind of mentioned here, like he's really talking about where tech and society overlap and that tech is not just like he says, working at Amazon or Google, like tech infiltrates everywhere. And so um, thank you for highlighting that experience and just some of the leadership and management skills that you learned as well. Um, Abhishek, what about for you as you reflect on, on you know, being a couple of years out of the program and your career growth? I, mean, I just want to start with Shannon saying that after he discussed all those new courses, I feel like I want to jump right back in. Um, but um, just starting on where, you know, when I came in, and I think somebody was mentioning this uh, before, is I did this for about 15, 20 years. I've been in the tech for 15, 20 years before I joined uh, Anderson. Um, you know, it's very easy for us to get into one space and keep doing that thing and maybe do a little bit more and be happy with it. But then at many point of time, you actually have to elevate yourself to 36,000 feet and see where do you stand as a leader? What does it all mean for your business, right? I think, I think the biggest thing that happened by going into an MBA program, especially with UCLA, is that the, the, the professors really challenged us to rise above and start to think different perspective. Why are we doing these things? What are some of the implications of these individual elements on society or on, or on uh, finance or on marketing or any of the areas uh, that business has? So I think that the, the whole idea about, and I think we still have this whole concept in UCLA about being a translator. I really, really believe in that. I remember Leadership Foundation day one when they said UCLA is all about making you the translator, I think that's that's literally something that you'll take away from this program because you're not gonna solve every problem by yourself. You're gonna have a, a elite team members working with you to do it, but can you translate what comes from the vision into something that people can actually implement, right? So I think that's the biggest learning. Obviously, Farzana hit it on the nail, persuasive skills. Like, are you able to express your thoughts and have the bind, whether from, the top management, whether from your peers or from your subordinates. I think we did a bunch of courses around that area and we have super professors going through persuasion skill, presentation skills. That's that's basic, that's bread and butter that you need to have, right? And and finally, I think, I think again, coming back to the point of the schools that we have, the, the certificate programs that we have an avenue to co connect with other batch mates, um, that really puts beautiful perspectives that you really need to be able to become a full rounded leader. And I think I was able to use that literally, Shannon, I don't know whether I've told you ever, I crafted my next position with my boss by using the skills I learned here. I literally went to him and said, this is what I can do for you. What do you say? He said, wow. right? So, so I, I think that should speak volumes in terms of what these programs can do transformationally for you. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't know that, but that is, that's really, really cool. 
um, to be able to sell that through at, at the level you're at. So I'd love to, I mean, I, I, I've been asking the questions, but I do want to open it up to, to Q&A from, from the um, broader group and, and let you ask some questions. Um, and, and just so anybody feel free to just start putting them in chat or just unmute and, and introduce yourself and, and feel free to ask. David, I think you might be trying to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> You saw it. <laughs> okay. So for, um, I did have a question about the certificate. So how is that normally uh, represented? Is this something we put on a resume, like as an achievement, or is this something we put on a LinkedIn profile? I do notice that, um, I think on one of the pictures, you have a sash. To, to, when you graduate, you have that sash. And I'm, I'm just curious, how how is that you know, represented? Yeah. Farzana and Amashek, do you want to maybe talk about how you kind of integrated that into your your story? Sure, um, I'll go. For, uh, I'll go. Uh, so I actually have added it to the LinkedIn profile. Uh, again, like as you mentioned here, education. You can you have a little blurb that you can mention there. So I've all, all, always kind of stated it there. Um, if you want to weave into your story, uh, I'm I'm updating my LinkedIn right now, so <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to do. But I'll incorporate it um, into your story itself. Right, because because that kind of talks about a broader scope that you're taking in terms of looking at technology. So both are required. Again, at the end of the day, these things are critical to to be mentioned. Um, and if you can reflect somehow in your story and kind of reference back to that, I think that will be more impactful. Awesome, thank you. Rosanna, yeah. is there? Do you have you talked about like some of the? I mean, sometimes I know with these certificates, it's actually talking more about the experience and exposure. But curious how you kind of have uh, why you decide to kind of in, in get get in that certificate, and then how do you sold it? Um, well, I, I got the Eastern certificate and the marketing certificate. And um, for me, I was just taking the classes that I really enjoyed, <laughs> that really like drew me in, and. Then I noticed at some point that I'm not too far off from getting the certificates. I was back and forth on whether I wanted to be constrained. And I noticed naturally that the marketing and the Easton certificates were the classes that I cared for and cared about and wanted to take. And so I had like one or two more classes to take to get the certificate. So that was my story. Um, and the marketing pairs really well because it's helped me with um, the influence. And it also ties in really great to the analytics and the data science. Um, and to answer the question directly, I, similar to Abhishek, I put it onto my LinkedIn, the certificate section and same thing with the resume. So I had like a PMP certificate and then two more UCLA certificates. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, we are getting a couple questions here. I want to, um, Jeremy, I know you asked if, um, I don't know if you know any of you uh, panelists looked at other schools, but I guess specifically Sloan and Kellogg you're asking, um, but maybe a little more about why you picked um, Anderson specifically, uh, especially if there was anything having to do, it seems like Jeremy's asking about the kind of people, the network, what you learned about that up front or, and if that influenced your decision. Um, so I really wanted to attend an LA school. So for me, it was between Anderson and USC. Been a lifelong UCLA fan through my family and heritage that way. And my husband, he's a two-time UCLA grad. So I was always leaning toward um, UCLA, um, but I did give USC a chance. I went on campus, I interviewed lots of students. I wasn't um, thrilled about their coursework there's a lot more breadth available at UCLA in terms of just um, EMBA electives and other Anderson electives. So it was a lot wider and richer. And then I really liked the idea that I could take classes at the School of Public Health, or I was even thinking at that time to take classes um, in the engineering program, but having that available and accessible to me was a big win. And then finally, it was also the people that I met and the cultural fit I felt um, a lot closer tied to UCLA with um, the diversity and just kind of the people that it drew versus the kind of people that were at um, uh, USC. So that was my story. Yeah. 
just adding a little color to that i think i did sort of put it in the chat really i mean it, it depends on what you're looking for right but if you want to look for some of the levers that you like will decide make you decide what you're going to go for so first lever is obviously are you specific to a location is location is a constraint for you like for like for zana i also chose la because i have a family and i wanted to have work life balance was very important for me to maintain right so that was one of the things so location is one thing obviously programs cost more or less so money may be a factor in certain cases these are not cheap programs they are very expensive so you got to make the call based on that the third thing um, that i uh, potentially think of in this case what are you looking for to get out of it right like a kellogg program i know watton program is very focused on finance very focused on entrepreneurship and so on wherein you know ucla could give you that round out you know leadership uh, focused uh, mba education so for me that was important so i chose this versus anything else so i think you have to look at these some of these factors and kind of figure out what really works for you obviously as ucla about uh, embas uh, and uh, alumni will say ucla is the best school at the end of the day it is you who make the school successful and then get the most out of it Thanks. I think that's real. I always say the same thing too. Thinking about what your priorities are. And I think especially, I don't know if you're looking from out of state, Jeremy, but like, I think the people that come from outside the LA area really talk about the diversity of thought and just the breadth of functions and industries. So I think that's, uh, Abhishek kind of highlighted that as well. Um, David had a question kind of about if we put COVID aside, which which none of you here on the screen with me today, you know, went to school in a, in a COVID time and, and we do have all intention that fall 2021 will be back on campus um, or have that option for those that feel comfortable. So I think there is always that question about the bi-weekly versus monthly. Kais, maybe you and, and thanks Mark, who's a current student who joined us today, he jumped in as well, but Kais, can you kind of explain the, the you know, what the experience was like as a monthly student and how you were able to develop relationships even if you weren't here as much as your counterparts? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you know, touch on the previous question. That's one of the primary reasons why um, I was so attracted to UCLA. Um, you know, like for Zana, I, I gave USC a chance. I'm not originally from the California area, so I didn't have any kind of loyalty to UCLA or USC prior to this, but uh, I went in and I sat in on some classes and I looked at the programs and for me, especially as a business owner, uh, someone who's trying to grow a business, I, I knew I couldn't make the time for the bi-weekly program, but I, when I, when I was on campus, uh, I said, okay, if, if we're going to be here, um, this is the program for me. And it's just a feeling, right? And then the program starts and you're in the monthly program. That's one of the things I was mentioning before is it was really unique to UCLA is that you on the the weekends that you are here you're here at the same time as the bi-weeklies uh so to me it was uh i didn't feel shorted right all i felt was that hey i have a cohort of 70 plus students uh that are there on every weekend with me but also another cohort uh, of 70 plus students that that uh, i can network with and get to know and um and and build relationships with. And that's really what it comes down to. So you hear a lot of these cliche things about, hey, this program is what you make of it. Um, reality of the situation is uh, I was able to dedicate the time that I needed to in order to complete my coursework. I was able to on, on non-class weekends and even during the week uh, join, uh, you know, come up for conferences and events. Um, I was able to network with uh, the biweekly students in electives and uh, during some of the the, the uh, travel that you know that's that's part of the program. So if you really think of it, it it's more of a class of 140 plus students. Um, just some of them you see you know once a month, and some you see uh, every other week. Um, and then of course, hopefully in a, in a post COVID world, you all will have the week you know monthly reunion that we all did there at the hotel. Uh, afterwards getting caught up. It really becomes just a, a, a big family. Um, and like I mentioned before, my business creation option, the BCO team is was made up of two students from biweekly and three students from the monthly program. Uh, so being able to make that work is, is, is um, it's a really unique privilege of this program. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Thank you for highlighting that, Kais, and and, um, and Mark for for your input as well. Um, I think that that definitely. I think it's. I, I say that there's monthly students. I see on campus more than biweekly students sometimes because it does allow you that flexibility to come to these conferences and all this, you know, and not have to come to campus every other weekend. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Tuan had a, a great question. Um, you know, do any of you panelists have you still even as you've graduated? Do you come back and reach out to you you know, either Professor Kramer or faculty, um, if not that specific, if you have a specific story there, great, or, you know, how have you come back as an alumni and still utilize some of the uh, resources? Rosanna? Well, I've reached out to Professor Kramer um, and some other professors um, for interview prep or feedback on different ideas playing around in my head. They've always been accessible and available. So I appreciate that. And then also my cohort um, met some of the most interesting, brilliant people. So whenever I have a struggle at work or if I wanna pitch an idea to someone who can speak my language, who can analyze it and guide me from a slightly different perspective, but, um, but add to my story and my analysis, I always go to my friends and cohorts. So both are great resources. Yeah, I hear I hear it's like the who wants to be a millionaire, like phone a friend. You basically have mm -hmm. like, you know, over a hundred people to phone a friend for any specific needs. So personal or yeah. professional. And I'd just like to add to that, Shannon. Yeah, so uh, I actually, on Tuesday, we have a, 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 one of our, you know, fellow students and I, we have a, a meeting with a professor who spent 25 years with a, you know, a TV network and we have a product that we want to pitch to a TV network. And so we're actually meeting with this professor to kind of just discuss, you know, what their uh, purchasing habits and patterns were and who the right people to talk to. So, you know, uh, it's, it's really a, an amazing network. Um, and when, when your WhatsApp group is tapped out, right? The WhatsApp group of the, of your, all, all the students of a hundred plus uh, students that are in it, they will always have someone that you can reach out to as well. So your network, their network becomes your network as well. So it's, it's absolutely. So the professors, uh, the, the administrator staff there and all the fellow students are one of the biggest takeaways from the program. Well, thanks so much. And Kais, and on that note, Abhishek, if you have anything to add to this, Karthik has asked, you know, when you think about your experience, did you learn more from, and these diverse ideas and new thoughts from your classmates or from professors in the curriculum? So how would you kind of talk about and reflect on that? Yeah, I, I would I would say it's it's a it's a twofold answer. So the the first thing is that obviously you know certain areas, certain subject areas, you may not have focused uh, as a part of your career or what you have learned so far. So from from that perspective, I think the school, the professors, the 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 method they use to teach us during these programs are definitely valuable. As those programs are happening, two things happens with your cohort. One they will have a different perspective that they will talk about the same problem or the same case study you are trying to solve, which you may not have thought about. And all of us will go into this program thinking, you know, we are the best, we have done great job and all of these talented people coming in. But when you sit in that classroom and have a small discussion in a small group or in larger forum, you'll see that people have so many different ideas that you didn't think of, that's one. The second benefit of the cohort is I think also the fact that interpersonal skills which you know you you are basically plugged into some new people that you have to work with and you have different groups through this course uh, duration of the course the interpersonal skills is another big value add which you will not see loudly called out but i think that's one of the most important things you'll learn and immediately apply back in your job Thank you so much, Abhishek. Well, I just want to thank, I know we're coming right to time. I want to thank so much our panelists. It's so nice to see all of you, as well as so many familiar faces here on Zoom of those um, applicants and prospects that are joining. So thank you so much. I hope you really are energized and excited about what lies ahead here at Anderson, especially as it, uh, as it uh, has to do with our technology curriculum and offerings. Uh, and please, just a reminder, we do have our second deadline. Uh, application deadline coming up February 1st, our final deadline May 1st. We are here to speak with you if you haven't had a chance to meet us yet. We'll send a follow-up email with all those resources. And I'm sure any of our panelists, you know, if you find them on LinkedIn and reach out, would be happy to share more as well. So 
just please be healthy and stay safe. And thank you all for joining. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.